And I'm going to uh, excuse the kids in just a moment. Any of the young people who are heading next door, you want to stand right now? I'll just pray for you, then we'll send you off with a blessing. Father, I thank you for what you're going to do in the meeting next door. I do pray for blessing and encouragement in Jesus' name. Amen. All right, I'll dismiss you. And let's open our Bibles to the very beginning. We're going to be looking at uh, Genesis chapters 1 and 2 today. By the way, last, last week as we, you know, I just, I just felt like, boy, if in the sharing, I just felt like some things were happening. I think the Holy Spirit really was speaking last week. I want to encourage you, if you weren't here, um, I think the message is probably still on Facebook. Um, uh, check that out. Um, really felt like it was a good introduction to our series here in the book of Genesis, uh, titled The Gospel According to Genesis. Again, the idea being that the gospel didn't begin to be preached in the gospel of Matthew in the New Testament, but really the gospel, the revelation of God to his creation and his redemptive plan really begins right in the book of Genesis, right at the very, very beginning. And so uh, really, uh, really significant. We're going to look at chapters one and two this morning. And uh, I'm actually going to, I'm going to read through them. We'll just read them together, take it in. Let the Word of God speak to us. But I want to frame it um, by saying that in some ways Genesis 1 and 2 is an, an introduction to us of God himself. It's the beginning of the disclosure of God to his creation uh, as recorded in the book of Genesis. Uh, last week I read a little bit from Halley's Bible Handbook, uh, and I'm going to read just a short portion of what I read last week. We believe that the Bible is not an account of human efforts to find God. In other words, this is not an attempt for, you know, the Bible is not people like trying to figure out, you know, what's God, what's he all about, and kind of like putting their best ideas together. I did that when I was in high school. Um, you know, as a you know, I can't remember, 1969, 1970, you know, a friend of mine and I, we would often, you know, just talk about, you know, what's out there, and, you know, is there a God, cool, you know, groovy, you know, and uh, we would listen to, you know, Moody Blues records in the background and try to figure out, you know, what's, what's going on in the cosmos and all this kind of stuff. We were, we were musing about God. The Bible is not men musing about God. It is God's revelation to us of himself, of his love, and his mercy. So Halley's Bible Handbook. We believe that the Bible is not an account of human efforts to find God, but rather an account of God's effort to reveal himself to humanity. It is God's own record of his dealings with people in his unfolding revelation of himself to the human race. The Bible is the revealed will of the creator of all humanity, given to his creatures by the creator himself, for instruction and guidance along life's path. This is God speaking to us. The book of Genesis begins with this declaration. So if you could put a subtitle under chapters 1 and 2, it would be God introducing himself to us. Uh, you're probably familiar with Genesis 1, Genesis 2. I think most people who've read the Bible at all probably just decided one day to just start at the beginning. Uh, you opened up to Genesis 1. In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. One of the things we're going to find, particularly through chapter 1, but then also in chapter 2, is that almost every word, every verse rather, has a reference to God. Almost every verse in chapters 1 and 2. In the beginning, God created the heaven and the earth. Verse 2, the Spirit of God was hovering. Verse 3, then God said. Verse 4, and God saw the light. Verse 5, God called the light day. Verse 6, then God said, over and over and over, this is a revelation of God to us. And so what we're going to be reading in chapters 1 and 2 is this revelation of God and 
in particular, the revelation of the story of creation. I'm going to tell you ahead of time what's interesting about Genesis 1 and 2 is that the story gets told several times, each time from a different angle. So we're going to read Genesis 1 and 2, and you're going to hear the story not once, not twice, but you're actually going to hear it kind of like told three times, different portion of it, so to speak. Now, you say, well, why, why would you do that? Well, we do it all the time ourselves. You know, if you, if you said to me, hey, Brother Rick, you know, I know you went to you know, Burlington this past week and, uh, you know, you started the radiation for your cancer. Um, and uh, how did it go for you in Burlington? I would say it went really well. No complications. That's the whole story right there. Now, I might then go to the next layer of detail. I might say to you, well, you know, it, it went well. The doctor and the, and the technicians were all really pleased. I mean, they were kind of like perfect, you know, results on all the meters that they have. I mean, it's amazing the equipment they have, right? And we were able to stay at this place provided by the American Cancer Society, free of charge, Hope Lodge, really quite amazing. So now I'm going into the next layer of detail. But the whole story was told at first by saying it went great. No complications. That's what we have in Genesis 1.1. In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. Drop the mic, boom, it's over. That's the whole story. But then we have, starting in verse 2, the next layer of detail. Then in chapter 2, you have the next layer again, a more specific telling. So if I was telling you my story, I'd say, it went great. Then the next layer is... Doctors, you know, technicians all thought it was good. Then I might tell you a specific story. Kind of interesting factoid, you know, from our week in Burlington was at Hope Lodge, we met a lot of people from Canton Potsdam. And one of the fellas we met there is the husband of a woman that Darlene has worked with in the theater world for the past decade. They actually, you know, uh, quite a lot of in interaction uh, but we've never met the husband. We met him, and we met some St. Lawrence University professors. So now I'm telling you another layer of detail. That's what we're going to hear as we read. But the whole thing, the story of creation, it's under the overarching theme of God. God revealing himself. So we're going to read it. Then we're going to talk about some of what we, what we understand from reading this section. I'm just going to read it, Jonathan. You don't have to show it on the screen. If you want to, if you have your Bible, you want to follow along, <clears throat> you can. But it's it's given to us very much in story form. And I'll read it, and I think you'll be able to follow along. Again, it's often m much of this is very familiar to you. Genesis 1:1. In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. The earth was without form and void, and darkness was on the face of the deep, and the Spirit of God was hovering over the face of the waters. Then God said, Let there be light, and there was light. And God saw the light, that it was good, and God divided the light from the darkness. God called the light day, and the darkness he called night. So the evening and the morning were the first day. Then God said, let there be a firmament in the midst of the waters, and let it divide the waters from the waters. Thus God made the firmament and divided the waters which were under the firmament from the waters, which were above the firmament, and, so, and it was so. And God called the firmament heaven, so the evening and the morning were the second day. Then God said, let the waters under the heavens be gathered together into one place, and let the dry land appear, and it was so. God called the dry land earth, and the gathering together of the waters he called seas, and God saw that it was good. And God said, let the earth bring forth grass, the herb that yields seed, and the fruit tree that yields fruit according to its kind, whose seed is in itself on the earth, and it was so. And the earth brought forth grass, the herb that yields seed according to its kind, and the tree that yields fruit, 
whose seed is in itself according to its kind. And God saw that it was good. So the evening and the morning were the third day. Then God said, let there be lights in the firmament of the heavens to divide the day from the night. And let them be for signs and seasons and for days and years. And let them be for lights in the firmament of the heavens to give light on the earth. And it was so. Then God made two great lights, the greater light to rule the day and the lesser light to rule the night. He made the stars also. God set them in the firmament of the heavens to give light on the earth and to rule over the day and over the night and to divide the light from the darkness. God saw that it was good. So the evening and the morning were the fourth day. Then God said, let the waters abound with an abundance of living creatures and let birds fly above the earth across the face of the firmament of the heavens. So God created great sea creatures and every living thing that moves with which the waters abounded according to their kind and every winged bird according to its kind. And God saw that it was good. And God blessed them saying, be fruitful and multiply and fill the waters in the seas and let the birds multiply on the earth. So the evening and the morning were the fifth day. And God said, let the earth bring forth the living creature according to its kind, cattle and creeping thing and beast of the earth, each according to its kind. And it was so. God made the beast of the earth according to its kind, cattle according to its kind, and everything that creeps on the earth according to its kind. And God saw that it was good. And God said, let us make man in our image according to our likeness. Let them have dominion over the fish of the seas, over the birds of the air, and over the cattle, over all the earth, and over every creeping thing that creeps on the earth. So God created man in his own image. In the image of God, he created him, male and female. He created them. Then God blessed them. God said to them, be fruitful and multiply. Fill the earth and subdue it. Have dominion over the fish of the sea, over the birds of the air, and over every living thing that moves on the earth. And God said, see, I have given you every herb that yields seed, which is on the face of all the earth. And every tree whose fruit yields seed, to you it shall be for food. Also, to every beast of the earth, to every bird of the air, and to everything that creeps on the earth in which there is life, I have given every green herb for food. And it was so. Then God saw everything he had made, and indeed it was very good. So the evening and the morning were the sixth day. Thus the heavens and the earth and all the hosts of them were finished. And on the seventh day, God ended his work, which he had done, and rested on the seventh day from all his works, which, we, which he had done. Then God blessed the seventh day and sanctified it, because in it he rested from all his works, which God had created and made. And now we start the, the third telling, the third portion. This is the history of the heavens and the earth when they were created in the day that the Lord God made the earth and the heavens. Before any plant of the field was in the earth, before any herb of the field had grown, for the Lord God had not caused it to rain on the earth, and there was no man to till the ground. But a mist went up from the earth and watered the whole face of the ground. And the Lord God formed man of the dust of the ground and breathed into his nostrils the breath of life, and man became a living being. The Lord God planted a garden eastward in Eden, and there he put the man whom he had formed. And out of the ground, the Lord God made every tree grow that is pleasant to the sight and good for food. The tree of life was also in the midst of the garden and the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. Now a river went out of Eden to water the garden. Um, and from there it parted and became four riverheads. The name of the first is Pishon. 
It is the one which skirts the whole land of Havilah, where there is gold. And the gold of that land is good, Bedellium and the onyx stone are there. The name of the second river is Gihon. It is the one which goes around the whole land of Cush. The name of the third river is Hedekel. It is the one which goes toward the east of Assyria. The fourth river is the Euphrates. Then the Lord God took the man and put him in the Garden of Eden to tend and keep it. And the Lord God commanded the man, saying, Of every tree of the garden you may freely eat, but of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil you shall not eat, for in it, in that day you eat of it, you shall surely die. And the Lord God said, It is not good that man should be alone. I will make him a helper comparable to him. Out of the ground the Lord God formed every beast of the field and every bird of the air and brought them to Adam to see what he would call them. And whatever Adam called each living creature, that was its name. So Adam gave names to all, cattle, to the birds of the air, and to every beast of the field. But for Adam, there was not found a helper comparable to him. And the Lord God caused a deep sleep to fall on Adam, and he slept. And he took one of his ribs and closed up the flesh in its place. Then the rib which the Lord God had taken from the man he made into a woman, and he brought her to the man. And Adam said, This is now bone of my bones and flesh of my flesh. She shall be called woman, because she was taken out of man. Therefore a man shall leave his father and mother and be joined to his wife, and they shall become one flesh. And they were both naked, the man and his wife, and were not ashamed. Genesis chapters 1 and two, the story of God introducing himself through creation itself. As we look at this, the question I'm kind of looking at this morning is, what do we learn about God? What does this tell us about God? What do we, what do we find about him? I want to talk about some particular aspects. First of all, we draw away, and you can put these in any order you want, but number one, we draw the idea that God is very specific in his creation. It's not happenstance. God is not simply just spinning the evolutionary flywheel and just letting it turn out the way it happens to turn out. God is very, very specific. There's specific design. His wisdom is evident here. Uh, he specifies what he, he's, he's specific in what he creates. He's specific in the purpose for which he creates things. Uh, you might take it for granted. Well, the sun brings light. That's because of God. God said it would. He was specific in that. Uh, you know, fish swim. That's because God said they would. He was very, very specific. He was specific in his commands to Adam and Eve, so God is very specific in his creation. That's important because as we read the rest of the, the chapters of the Bible, 1,187, if I'm not mistaken, we're actually reading the unfolding details of what we read in chapters 1 and 2. In other words, the rest of the book is going to flow from these chapters. In some ways, I understand we could, we could just start reading the Bible anywhere and probably be very encouraged. But chapters 1 and 2 set the stage for the fact that there's a God who's very specific in his design, has specific purposes in his design. Number two, we read about a God who initiates. He initiates. All this happened because God decided to. Nobody pressured him. There was nothing to make him. Uh, he purposed in himself to do it. He just, God said. He created the heavens and the earth. Didn't have to. He was God in himself without any of this. There was no, you know, he, he decided to do it. He initiated and over and over in Scripture, again, the next 1,187 chapters, what you're going to read about is a God who initiates, a God who reaches out, 
a God who, who, who even makes it possible for us to know him. The fact that we're even talking about God today is because he's made us in his image. He initiated something, and we have the capacity to even be aware of the fact that there is a God. When I was in high school and we we're talking with my friend about, you know, is there a God? What's on, out in the cosmos? You know, what's in the stars? And, you know, is there a heaven? And we're listening to the moody blues and everything else. And, you know, we're, we're asking those questions because God initiated and he made it possible for us to be even aware that there's a God at all. God initiated this. Number one, he's specific in his design. Number two, he initiates. Number three, he has set order and purpose in his creation. Order and purpose in his creation. It says in verse, one, verse 2 that, you know, the earth was formless and void. God, the Spirit of God is hovering. The word formless basically means a, kind of like a wilderness, uninhabited or uninhabitable is maybe a better way to say it uninhabitable wilderness, and it was void, meaning it's vacuum, it's empty, it's uninhabited. So there's, you might say, two problems. The uninhabitable, it's a wilderness, and number two then, it needs inhabitants. It needs shape. It needs to be ordered, and then it needs to be filled. I want you to imagine, let's say you you decide you're in the real estate business or you're going to get into the real estate business and, um, you know, you, you buy a, a house that's kind of a fixer-upper to turn, o turn, o turn over. You know, you're going, to, uh, you're going to buy it, you know, fix it up. You go in and you're like, nobody could live here. Just like, we got, we got to make this place habitable. Let's say it's really run down and you've got to clean up the mess and you've got to you got to put the kitchen in. You've got to repair things. In other words, you make it first habitable in order that then, what? Inhabitants can come. Interestingly, and you can study this out more, but days one and two and three in the creation story are essentially God making things habitable. He's basically saying, okay, sun, moon, stars, you do that, light, dark, in other words, he's setting order, he's making it habitable, and then days four, five, and six, generally, of the creation story, are him putting in inhabitants. He takes that which is formless and void, that which is an uninhabitable wilderness, and then he makes it, he makes it habitable in order that inhabitants can come. God does this. He has specific order and purpose in his creation. In all of this, he shows his awesome power. Number four, what do we find out about God? And this is going to be the end of the story this morning. It's the, the wow factor. In other words, if you read this, now, I understand there's a lot of ways we could read the book of Genesis, chapters one and two, and there's a lot of details, a lot of questions we might ask, a lot of particulars we might, but I want you to just step back, and I want you to just say, wow. Wow. That's, that's in some ways the, the response we should have as we take in what's happening in this narrative here in chapters 1 and 2. He's showing his absolutely awesome power. You and I, we understand this as those who have been made in the image of God. We understand what it is in the illustration I used before to take something that's uninhabitable and make it habitable so that inhabitants can go in. But generally, we work with stuff that already is there. We're rearranging things. We're manipulating things. You know what God does? He does it out of nothing. You, know, you thought you did pretty good. <laughs> he does it out of nothing. And he makes it. He calls it into existence. And then he brings order to it. He shows his awesome power. Another thing I see in this, and of course we behold this on a regular basis ourselves, is that in all this order and function, there's beauty. 
That's, that's, that's a re- all of this is a reflection of who God is, of, of his majesty, his power. There's, there's beauty. It's not just utilitarian. Um, sometimes when we design things, hopefully we design it with an eye on beauty, but a lot of times we design things, we design it just to get the job done. You know, that's, you know when, uh, when I stopped uh, on the way here, you know, Merrick and I, my son, we, I gave him a ride to Potsdam this morning, but first we had to stop at the gas station. You know, uh, gas stations have a utilitarian function. You walk up, you know, you stick in your credit card, you get the hose, you put the gas in, it's hopefully not too stinky, you get the job done. What I, what I, my, my main reflection as I was filling the gas tank this morning was, it's really cold this morning. That was my, uh, it's, it's the beginning. Um, so I'm feeling, there's, it's utilitarian, it's for a purpose. Now again, they, you know, nowadays they try to make gas stations nice. I want you to know something. Everything God did, it was like off the charts, beautiful. Off the charts, beautiful. You know, I got to fill up the gas tank. And so there's this hose and, a, you know, I, I pull, hold the handle and hopefully it's not too smelly. When you got to fill up, your tummy tank. You know what God said? I'm going to make food that looks really good. And it's going to smell good. And it's going to taste good. And when you're, going to do- when you're done, you're going to say, oh, that was really, really good. I didn't hear any of that from my car this morning. <laughs> not, not a bit of it. Didn't even burp. Just, just, just like it's utilitarian. God does all this in a way that is absolutely off the charts, beautiful, beautiful. You know, Darlene and I, when we take walks, oftentimes we're, you know, we're looking at the sky, the clouds, and just, just the beauty of the, the sky, just different times of day, you know, one of the things we've talked about through the years is the different colors, and I'm not, a, I'm not an artist, so I don't know all the particulars. She's much better than that, with that than I am, but even during the different seasons, it's almost like there are different color tones that are, that are brought out in the clouds. It's like this, this amazing canvas. A couple of nights ago, we, were, we took a walk just at, uh, just at twilight, and uh, uh, we were looking at the the blue that was framed by these clouds, and she's saying, "Oh, and there's purple, and there's you know." She's naming all these colors. I don't know all that. I never graduated beyond, beyond the Crayola eight box. Um, uh, you know, if it wasn't red, green, blue, <laughs> black, or brown, I was like, "I'm lost." Yellow. Um, uh, you know, when you got to sixty four, I'm I'm yeah, it's not my deal. Um, but she's talking about all these colors. And I know, when she says it, I know it. I'm like, yeah, that's, that's a different color. And that's, that, yes, absolutely. God did it beautifully. It's a reflection. And again, we, we take in the, the thing itself, and it's awesome. But all of this, this canvas, and what's on the canvas is a reflection of the artist. Everything you're looking at tells you something about the artist. I know music much better than I know art. When I listen to a piece of music, I'm like, oh, you know, some of the, some of the great masters, I'm like, that is, wow. Not just the classical, every, every genre seems like there are really gifted people. And I'm like, oh, how, how, I would like to meet J.S. Bach. I'd like to meet Beethoven. I, I'd like to meet these guys. There's contemporary musicians. I'm like, wow, so, Gifted. I mean, that was, that's a reflection. All of this a reflection. And again, God, God does it out of nothing. He shows his power. He shows his majesty. He shows his awesomeness in all of this. One of the things I like about this is there's an emphasis then put on the God stepping back and saying, Shh, that was good. <laughs> that was good. That was good. We who are 
made in his image. We understand that. You know, you know what that's like. You know what it's like to uh, you know, work on a you know, house project before. You know what it's like to, to work on the house project and you, know, you take a room. Maybe it's, maybe it's just a cleaning project. One of the things Darlene loves to do periodically is just do, like, she calls it deep cleaning. Um, deep cleaning means everything gets moved, everything gets changed. Um, you know, hopefully, <laughs> just amazing. I mean, she really goes to town. But when it's done, it's like, that's, I, I, didn't, I, don't grow up, I didn't grow up with that kind of that mindset. You know, when I got to college, I had a black chest that I carried everything in. I put it in the dorm room against the wall. It sat there the whole semester, never moved. The idea of, I saw other students coming in and out of their dorm rooms with rugs, and sound systems, and posters, and all this. I'm like, I just don't think that way. I'm very utilitarian. And there's this sense when we're done, and I helped Darlene, and we rearrange a room, we maybe moved all the furniture out, everything gets cleaned, it gets put back in in a different place. There's this sense of, oh, that is good. That is good. You know where that comes from? God. It's us who are made in, in, in his image, having just, a, just a, little, a little speck of what happens here when God steps back and says, right, purpose, order, design, beauty, Function. It's like God says, that's, that's it. That's it. And that's what's happening in Genesis chapters 1 and 2. And again, the particulars matter. And from these particulars, in some ways, the foundations of an understanding of purpose and order of us as those in submission to him, it flows in many ways out of Genesis 1 and 2. But this morning, what I'm focusing on is the idea that all of this really is pointing upward. Yes, it is the story of Adam and Eve. It's the story of their purpose. It's the story of God's design for them. It's the story of all these things. But all that flows out of a God who is himself, a God who's powerful, who initiates, who is specific in his design, who's, who's creative, who has a purpose for things. And with all of that, and this is where I want to go this morning, what we have to recognize is that rather than approaching God to say, God, what will you do for me? We need to approach God and say, God, you have a specific purpose for everything you've created, including me. You have a specific design for me. Next week, we'll talk about how in Genesis chapter 3, sin mess things up, but that God has a plan to restore. But we go to God and we say, God, more than me telling you what you ought to do for my life, I want you to tell me what you've designed me for. I want you to tell me as a man or as a woman what's your, what your design. I want you to tell me as, 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 as someone who is a creature, a created one, not the creator, I want you to tell me, how do I relate to you? How do I relate to people? How do I relate to my work? How do I relate to all of life? I want you to teach me your ways because you're a God who initiated. You're a God who was specific in your creative purposes and plans. I want to receive from you. I want you to tell me. I want you to now, in a sense, I want you to shape me in the same way you shaped that which was formless and void. In other words, I want you to put your fingerprints on me, God. I think that one of the problems we have in our culture today, and this is, this is endemic of modern man, is that modern man, overlooking the majesty of God in creation, overlooking the majesty of God in all that he has revealed, is consumed with himself and self-fulfillment, searching desperately for meaning and purpose, but having forgotten that it all flows from God himself. We somehow think that we can cut God out of the equation, 
his plans, his purposes, and that we're going to find meaning and purpose without him. That's the, that's the concept of secular society. That we can do life from A to Z without God, and we can just kind of add him in as an afterthought. It all flows from him. It all begins with him. When we go to him and we say, God, you are amazing. How am I designed to fit into your purposes? What is your will for my life? Not as what is my will and how do you serve me? That's upside down. That's backwards. Overlooking the revelation of God, modern man is consumed. He's consumed with self-fulfillment, and it's an unending chase. You cannot get satisfied in it apart from the revelation that I was made by him, for him, I exist by the power of his word, and I find my rest in who he is. Again, Genesis 1, verse 2 talks about the earth being formless and void. And in some ways, if there's a prayer that we ought to be praying, it's, Lord, would you make my life habitable? And would you be the main inhabitant? Would you, would you take that which is needing reshaping? Just like you did. You separated the light from the darkness. You separated the waters from the waters. You separated the firmament from that was above. I mean, just he, he did it all. Call forth the birds, the fish, the cattle, every creeping thing that creeps on the earth. In other words, he, he, he spoke, God, would you now work in my life your plans and your purposes that I would find my life in you. And what happens as we do that, and it's the power of Christ that we might have that experience. It's the power of Christ that we, who, again, next week we'll talk about the, the problem of sin and how God has, has made a way for us. But it's the power of Christ that allows us then to have relationship with God and out of that, somehow, it's almost like a, we come in contact with God's original purpose, the divine image. He, he made us in his image. So all those things we talked about with God, it's almost like they start to flow in us. It's like we, the creativity flows. One of the things I've seen about people who come to Christ, there's a, there's a flow of creativity. It's absolutely amazing. One of the things that Christ does with our lives is, Suddenly, we're living disordered lives, and the power of Christ comes. We start to realize his call to live in an orderly way, orderly with our relationships, orderly with our possessions even. Uh, one of the things we studied a few years ago when we were talking about the, uh, uh, the Reformation, the 500th anniversary of Luther, Martin Luther, and his posting of the, of this, this, the 95 Theses in 1517. One of the things that I came across as I was studying back in 2017, uh, was that the early reformers, one of the things that they re reclaimed, as it were, was the idea of God's work in us in areas of vocation. In other words, church, or spiritual life is a better way to say it, spiritual life wasn't simply like your Sunday morning add-on slice in an otherwise secular life, but that the very things we do, the vocations we have, whether it's a, uh, you know, a shoemaker or w whatever it is, an artist, there's a sense in which this is God's anointing, and in Christ, all these things get reclaimed. They get recovered. It's absolutely, absolutely amazing. But it begins with him. Modern man is absolutely man-centered. Absolutely man-centered. The church of the Lord Jesus Christ, in some ways, what we need to do is we need to reclaim a message, a gospel message that begins with him, that is centered on him, that is not centered on me and, in a sense, what I want, but is centered on him and what he wants, him as the central figure. 
That should be reflected in our preaching, should be reflected in our music, should be reflected in our fellowship. What does God say? What does God say? You know, uh, in a room, even with this many people, there's a lot of opinions here. We can talk about any number of things. You know, we can talk about politics, we can talk about economics, we can talk about every, all kinds of opinions. At the end of the day, where do we need to land? What does God say? What does God say? In him, we live and move and have our being. That's from the book of Acts. In him, we live and move and have our being. We find ourselves in him. I want to encourage you today. Today's a day for us to bow the knee before a God who has revealed himself. Let's pray. Father, I come before you today, and I thank you. Sierra, would you come on up, grab your guitar? I thank you for your revelation. And that you, having made us in your own image, have made us with the capacity the capacity to know you, the capacity to even to search for you. I thank you for that. Saint says we're just praying for a moment. I want you to understand that the yearning you have for God is only there because he has, he has made you with the capacity to have that yearning. You think about for a second. I don't know if they still have them anymore. Back when I was a kid, they would. A popular, popular thing was a little ant farm, a little plastic thing. You'd fill some dirt and put ants in it and get to watch them. I would often think about the ant colonies and think, boy, I wonder if they know I'm here. <laughs> I wonder if they know I'm watching them. For a while I realized they don't they don't have a clue. They don't know what I am. The only reason you have the capacity to even ask the question, God, are you there? God, what's your will for my life? Is because He gave you that capacity. He made you in His image because He wants fellowship with you. This God who is absolutely awesome, awesome in power, awesome in majesty, awesome in every aspect of who he is, is looking for relationship with us. Let's come to him today. Let's worship him. Let's respond to this God who initiates